from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, I am so happy today to be here to celebrate a lively voice in teen literature, Ellen O's voice. Critics have praised Ellen's work for being lush and complex. Ellen lives in Bethesda, Maryland. That's right, she's a local gal. But her imagination roams far beyond the Beltway. There are blue dragons in her three novels, water sprites, demons, a brave female hero, an ancient Asian landscape, and lots of action. Ellen's first two novels in her prophecy trilogy made readers hungry for more, more adventure, more remarkable characters. So Ellen gives just that in her third novel, the final book in the series. King has already received lots of critical praise. Booklist called it an attractive historical fantasy. In addition to being an author, Ellen is also an advocate for young people's literature. She's one of the founders of the We Need Diverse Books campaign. This national group is dedicated to making sure that the diverse world that we live in is also reflected in the literature that we share with young people. So that means um, young people of all cultures, races, sexual orientations, faiths, and mental and physical abilities should have a place as characters in children's books. We are so lucky to have Ellen as both an author and an advocate and a local gal. So please join me in welcoming Ellen O. lights. Okay. I have slides, so just in case I go ahead of myself, my visual guy's going to help me keep track, right? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for coming in to see me today. My name is Ellen O, and my presentation is called Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time, just might be, and I forgot to do this. It's not working. Okay. Once upon a time, just might be the most powerful words in the world. Because you know what's coming next. Once upon a time means your spine is tingling, you're sitting up straight in your chair, and you're going to be transported into another world. Another experience, another reality. And who doesn't need that? Because truth is, we all need that. Stories are what connect us to each other. It is how we share the human experience. And there are a lot of stories, millions of them. It's not working. Oh, it worked. Yet in this country, there's a similarity to all these stories. There's a sameness. Once upon a time, there was a straight, white, cisgendered, able-bodied boy or girl who lived in an upper middle class neighborhood and were always the heroes of their wonderful adventures. Now these are great stories, but there's something missing. On November 9th, 1986, the great Walter Dean Myers wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times called Children's Books. I actually thought we would revolutionize the industry. In that piece, he said, if we continue to make black children non-persons by excluding them from books and by degrading the black experience, and if we continue to neglect white children by not exposing them to any aspect of other racial and ethnic experiences in a meaningful way, we will have a next racial crisis. Flash forward to 2012. Despite census data that shows 37% of the US population consists of people of color, Children's Books Publishing did not keep pace. The Cooperative Children's Book Center, which gathers statistics on this issue every year, shows that out of 3,600 children's books published and reviewed by the CCBC, only 7% were about a person of color. And that's what's missing, diversity. But why? 
Why is it still missing? Sarwat Chatta, a British Indian author, tells a story about talking to a bookseller about his new middle grade series, the Ash Mystery Series. When the bookseller stopped him and said, oh, I don't see the need to stock your book because we don't have Indians in our community. To which he replied, bet you don't have a lot of hobbits either. <laughs> There's a bit of a disconnect. You know, see, people seem to think that diverse books are not always for them that white audiences won't read a book about a non-white character. But who is it that won't read a diverse book? The child or the gatekeeper? You see, a few years ago, I was at the bookstore and I saw a young girl absorbed in this book, The Mighty Miss Malone by Christopher Paul Curtis. And I was just about to go over to her and tell her, oh, that's a great book, you should definitely get it, when her mother walked over and took it out of her hands and said, no, honey, that's not for you. And that's how it begins. You see, a child doesn't care who the book is about. All the child cares about is that it's a good story. But you know who cares? The gatekeeper, the parent, the librarian, the teacher, the grandparent, they make a judgment call. And they decide what they think their child, their student, will relate to. And the sad thing is, they seem to think that talking animals are more relatable than people of color. So the truth about diversity is that it's an important discussion to have because racism still exists, and racism exists because of ignorance. Now, I've been asked to talk about diversity a lot, and usually I focus on why it is important for minority kids growing up in this country to see themselves represented in literature and movies and TV. But more and more I've realized that this is only part of the problem. Diversity is not only for the underrepresented, Truth is, diversity is important for everyone. All people need to be exposed to other races and other cultures in positive ways. All people need to learn tolerance and acceptance of differences. When we promote only a homogeneous view of society in our literature and our media, and deem books or movies about minorities as unsuccessful, it harms everyone. But worse, we fail in our duty to educate and inspire the minds of our children. Now, nearly 30 years later, after his first op-ed piece, Walter Dean Myers was back with another message. On March 15, 2014, the New York Times published two more op-ed pieces, Where Are the People of Color in Children's Books by Walter Dean Myers and The Apartheid of Children's Literature by his son, Christopher Myers. The last line of Mr. Myers Sr.'s heartfelt piece said, there is work to be done. And the saddest part of that statement is that when we lost him last year, we lost not only one of the greatest writers of our generation, but also our strongest diversity champion and advocate. But by writing that last op-ed piece, Mr. Myers left us with an important task, to continue the work that he had championed all his life. And then something happened. Something happened that set off a movement. The largest book conference, Book Expo America, announced a guest lineup for their one-day book event called BookCon that included 30 authors and celebrities. Yay! There was not one person of color in that lineup, and the only diversity was the grumpy cat. <laughs> for the first time, the blatantness of the problem, so soon after the Myers articles, could no longer be ignored, and people became angry. And anger is a powerful force. So a team of 22 people decided to do something really big and make a statement. And we came up with a hashtag, we need diverse books. Now I don't think any of us could have predicted the response that we were gonna get. Nor could we have predicted how moved we'd be by the submissions. We need diverse books because let people tell us exactly how not having diversity in their life affected them. To the queer girl who said, if I I might not have tried to kill myself if I had seen myself represented in the books I read to the little black boys that say, we need diverse books because we're super superheroes too. These are powerful stories that were even more meaningful when paired with the visual of a real life human. We need diverse books because of everything in the circle. We need diverse books because we are superheroes. In the years since we formed, things began to change. Most notably, 
The ALA Media Awards was a celebration of, a di of diverse books and authors in all categories, but in particular, the Newbery Award that had three diverse books as the award winners. Kwame Alexander's The Crossover, Jacqueline Woodson's Brown Girl Dreaming, and C.C. Bell's El Defo. And furthermore, our Indiegogo campaign was so successful for our fundraising effort that We Need Diverse Books can now provide awards, grants, internships, and classroom initiatives to promote the message of diversity in children's literature. And this is wonderful because this picture statistic, this is my daughter's. I mean, they are the kids looking for books about characters like them, heroes like them. But when I couldn't find books for them to relate to, I wrote it myself. These are my books, the Prophecy series. It tells the story of a girl named Kira with yellow eyes who can see and smell demons that enter her world. She is sworn to protect her young cousin, Prince Tejo, who may or may not be the hero of the Dragon King's prophecy. And when a demon invasion threatens the Seven Kingdoms, Kira must do everything she can to protect her cousin and save the world. This is my imagination of Kira. A little old, actually, but it works. So Kira is a strong Asian girl character in a patriarchal society who can't accept that a girl can be a hero. She is the antithesis of every stereotypical Asian female character that I had been subject to, subjected to in my entire life. Stereotypes like the smart, quiet, nerdy sidekicks or the scary dragon lady villains. I wanted to kind of destroy the Asian woman stereotype once and for all and give my girls a Katniss that they could root for. I wrote Prophecy for all the girls out there looking for someone like Kira. I wrote it for a new generation of boys who would never think of girls as the weaker sex again. But mostly, I wrote it for myself. I wrote it for that younger me who once scoured every single book in the library searching for something that I didn't even know I was missing. What I loved about writing the series is that it introduces Western readers to a mythology and a place they are not familiar with. Prophecy is a young adult fantasy novel set in ancient Korea, and it's filled with things like Korean palaces, garden pavilions, mountains, temples, and monks. And mythological creatures unique to Korea like the imugi, half eel, half dragon, all evil, and demons that eat your organs and wear your skin like a Halloween costume. Okay, that part's not Korean, that's actually just me being kind of, <laughs> but. So people always ask me, why do you write your novels about Korea? And the easy answer is to say, it's my heritage, it's my culture. A history I didn't even know much about until I started to learn about it myself. I wanted my children to be exposed to a side of their heritage that they don't get to read a lot about. But also, there's a deeper reason. The reason why diversity and my culture and heritage are so important to me. It was my parents who taught me to love books. They taught me to read at a very young age. They raised me at the library. In fact, sometimes they'd leave me in the library all day, all night, come back for me five days later. Was, you know, librarians were my babysitters growing up. Books were my life. But when you were young, you don't know what is missing if you've never seen it in the first place. You see, the first time I truly realized what I had felt missing all my life was when I read The Joy Luck Club in my 20s. I cried like a baby. Weeks, months later, i just think about that book and I'd start just weeping. And when the movie came out, oh my god, Niagara Falls. I related to this book in such a deep and compelling way. It was a spiritual connection for me because this once upon a time was about a girl like me with immigrant parents like mine. You see, growing up Asian in New York, it wasn't easy for me. When I was younger, it felt like racism was always just in your face. I got called every kind of racist slur you could think of, but chink was pretty much the one I heard the most. And it really, really bothered me a lot because you know, damn it, I'm a gook, not a chink. And if you're gonna insult somebody, get your racial slurs right, right? But the thing about racism, though, is that it can cause you to develop a self-hatred of yourself and a disconnect with your identity. You reject who you are, and you start to wish for the impossible. You wish that your parents didn't speak with an accent, 
and that you didn't eat rice with every meal. You wish for something that you can't ever change, and you start to hate yourself and your family. I think a lot of kids of immigrant families can relate to this experience. Truth be told, racism is what made me who I am today. Let me explain. Racism was a cigarette burned to my flesh by the high school girl who called me a dirty chink when I was eight. It was a shock of having a kind-looking grandmother scream at me to go back to my own country because she didn't want my kind ruining her country. I was 22. It was having a group of teenagers shout, where's my pork fried rice, bitch, while I was walking with my little girls. I was 35. I learned to be wary. Racism is so damaging that when anything bad happens to you, you can't help but think, was it about my race? But when I was 16, at the worst of my self-loathing, I found something to connect me back to my cultural identity. You see, my dad was also a storyteller. And it was at this time that he finally started to write down some of his stories. And in the process, I began to listen to him, which I didn't always do. And he started telling me about a world far removed from my own experience, about war and hunger and running away at a young age to escape the communist recruiters. These stories reminded me about who I was and where I came from, a reminder about my heritage. It was these stories that made me re rediscover my pride and love of who I really was. I am a proud Korean American. So let me share with you one of my favorite stories that my father told me. It is the famous legend of the Ha clan. Yes, my maiden name is Ha, and I married an O. You are not allowed to hyphenate my name, sorry. All right, the magic fish story. Once upon a time, many hundreds of years ago, the Ha clan lived near the sea, but outside of the village boundaries. When invaders came to their village, all the villagers ran up into the mountains to hide, but the Ha's didn't hear the warning bells until it was almost too late. And with invaders on their feet, they began to run as fast as they could to a nearby lake. And the father the, saw that his family was in trouble, and he said, Dear Heavenly Father, please, please help us. Help us invade this, these horrible people. And a light shone down in the middle of the lake, and the father saw that his entire family had been changed into big, magical, colorful carp, fish. And he said, thank you. And then he was turned into a fish and plopped into the lake also. And to this day, no hashi can ever eat a carp because it will be eating their long lost ancestor and it will taste terrible to them. And I said, dad, that is the worst story in the world. I mean, if you were gonna tell me a magic legend about ancestors, you know, make it about tigers. Make it about, you know, something that isn't fish, that's demoralizing. And my dad gets all cryptic to me and he says, like Master Uwe from Kung Fu Panda, you must accept your past in order to fulfill your future. And I don't even know what that means. And I don't think he knows what that means. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not ready to accept my magic fish background here. So I go to a Japanese restaurant, I'm like, magic fish my butt, and I order carp. <laughs> and I eat it. And I spit it out. And I said, holy ancestors, I'm so sorry, because it is the worst tasting thing in the world. So the moral of the story is never eat carp. It really is disgusting. And I clearly come from a line of long bullshit artists. But this is a story that's part of my heritage, and I'll pass it on to my children. In early 2014, my dad suffered a major stroke that left him paralyzed and barely able to talk. But the worst part of it is that he lost his memory. He doesn't recognize me or his grandkids. He's still my dad, but he's not the same. And I miss him. I miss talking to him. I miss his ugwe like wisdom. And I miss his corny jokes and his laughter. But his stories are here. And they're part of me and my self-identity, an important part of who I am and I'll share them with my kids so that they will always know and remember. But the story doesn't end there. You see, diversity is more than race and religion. Let me share another story. Once upon a time, my middle child was six years old and she inherited her, old sister, her older sister's heavy winter coat and she hated it because she said it made her look poofy like a big blue snowman. 
And she said, please, can I get a new skinny coat? And I said, no, there's no reason to. And she said, can I tell you a story? I said, okay. And she said, once upon a time, there was a big, ugly monster who lived in a cave under a mountain. And he had long needles for fingers and sharp knives for teeth. And his favorite food was little children. And one day, three kids were sledding on the mountain when there was a big hole and they fell in. And the monster came after them and they were screaming and running around and they saw a little hole and the first two dashed out, but the third one got stuck because she was wearing a poofy coat. <laughs> so, mom, can I get a skinny coat? All right, so how could I possibly have known that seven years later, the same funny, charming, happy, creative kid would suffer from a depression so severe that she would become a danger to herself? You see, depression is one of those invisible disabilities that people don't like to talk about. That's part of the problem. Mom, she says, why can't people understand what I'm going through? But how can they know if they don't, if, if she doesn't tell them her story? And why is it her job to educate those who don't understand? It isn't her job, and it isn't up to her, but that is the position she has been put into. You see, there's a huge stigma that is still attached to those who have mental illness. It is something that is hard for people who don't have it to understand. People think you should be happy. Just shake it off. Stop being so mopey. Have you ever told a cancer patient to just shake off the cancer? You can't do it. Depression is a disease. She said she wanted to be honest. She wanted to tell people and share her story. And in the process, she lost friends because they weren't ready to hear her story. It made, her, it made them uncomfortable. Now, these are not bad kids. These are not unsympathetic kids. They just don't understand because mental illness is not talked about. And if even adults don't really know what it is, how can the kids? So when we talk about diversity, it has always been a conversation that seemed to start and end with race. But what has always distinguished the We Need Diverse Books campaign is the absolute inclusivity of all types of diversity, diversity that transcends race. All voices need to be represented. Stories are so much more than words. They are powerful and emotional. They change lives and they teach us about the world. Everyone has a story to tell and everyone needs a story to cherish most especially our children. Once Upon a Time is our path to a better future. Thank you. So I have five minutes left, and I'm happy to take some questions. There are two mics right here. If you can come on up, and I shall answer. Maybe the truth. Maybe I'll tell you a story. A magic fish story. Yes. I was wondering, because you, when you write, you use a lot of myths and legends, do you start to plan the plot first, or do you look for myths or legends that would fit, you know, fit where the story is going first? That is a great question. Now, for me, I'll tell you, my stories seem to literally pop into my head as if a movie's playing. And I think what happens is that I've done so much research and reading already that what I want to use to, to tell the story is here, and then it kind of just, I dream my stories or something. So, good question, thank you. Yes? Hi, my name's Nicole, I teach seventh grade. Um, I was wondering if you could um, give us some titles of diverse books that you would recommend for middle grade, especially ones that deal with mental health issues. Ah, mental health issues for middle grade books. I'm going to have to get back to you on that because the lights are staring in my face and my brain stopped functioning. But if you go to the We Need Diverse Books website, I, what I'll do is I'll ask our librarians to start putting together a list of that question. If you don't mind, maybe even just sending an email or an ask on Tumblr, that'd be great. All right, thank you. That's a great question. Yes, hi. Um, a lot of um, tragedies are about race. Do you think having device, di diverse books would help that for kids in the I'm, future? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? A lot of um, national tragedies are about race. Do you mm -hmm. think um, having more diverse books for kids now will help that in the future? Oh, thank you. That's a brilliant question, and I absolutely do believe that's true. I think that when kids, especially when they're young, are exposed to different stories and different cultures, and they understand and empathize with who people are, then it's harder to hate somebody that you know that you can relate to. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Yes. Will you be writing another series about a Korean girl or in sort of like Kira's world? Actually, no. My next series is a contemporary ghost story with a character who's actually half Korean and a Korean shaman, and they defeat ghosts and demons. So it's going to be cool, but it's contemporary, so not historical. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was wondering, uh, you, you write books about people who were like going through things and stuff, but um, how do you think like the more non-diverse books have an impact on people's minds when they're growing up? I think all books are wonderful and important. There's a place for every book out there. And you know, a lot of the books that you read in your curriculum are really an important part of your learning and educational process. I just think that adding diverse books to that mix, especially in education, can really open up the minds of all our students. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm a high school librarian and um, 2,500 students from 48 countries. Wow. And this is Suicide Prevention Month. And I have some great recommendations, suicide notes, the song may save your life. And I really went out on a limb putting that up on the bulletin board. And I have 50 books out to begin with, and they're all checked out. It's a big, at the high school level, it's a major concern. So there's many, many, I think the other one, Gloria O'Connell's Day, there's so many books, and the kids will give you the titles, and please buy them. Thank you, and thank you for reminding me. It is really important to really support the kids, especially in high school, when they're having some of the hardest times out there, middle grade, uh, middle school and high school, and I hope that all of you will remember that depression is a disease, that it, you know, you can't ignore it. We have to help them. Yes? I was just wondering um, how your daughter is. How you doing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> She's, she has her ups and downs. So. But thank you. Yes. Have you written any other books? I'm uh, just, I just sent my editor a new book, which is The Ghost Story. So hopefully that'll come out in 2017. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh. Uh, one last question and we have to wrap up. Okay. Yes. Um, one of my favorite books I've ever read is by the point of view of an um, American Indian girl. And when that book won the Newbery Prize, it was criticized just because she, the main character was American Indian. Did anyone ever criticize your books because they were diverse? Unfortunately, there's always going to be people who don't like what you say or do. There are always going to be people who hate you just for who you are. And you have to rise above that. So I don't, you know, there's a, there's a saying that, you know, I let my haters motivate me. So whenever I get something that's kind of like racist or maybe hate felt, I just go, okay, now you've motivated me to write more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.